Welcome to the Startup Grind. I'd like to introduce uh, Kwame Anku. He's the co-founder of Black Tech Angel Fund. Uh, he was named one of the top 25 black VCs to watch in 2018 by Pitch Book. He's an advisor for Carl the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And an interesting story, he actually worked, he was worked on an app for Prince. And with that, please give him a warm welcome. You already have to stand, I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> you, already, you already got a standing ovation. Right. <laughs> the bar is so high now, you aspire to something. So what I usually like to do is I like to try out and get the audience to know you first. Sure. So like, where are you from, like, what did your parents do? Okay, uh, would you, if you don't mind what I'd love to do, sure. uh, I, I would like to find out from three people why you came out tonight. That would be very helpful to me. I want to be able to help you all. So get these two young ladies, one of the brave souls, and then my, my buddy. Okay, so yes. My broker said I needed to come. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the back here. Thank you, broker. Back in the day. Broker speaks, you listen. Okay, got it. Okay, yes, ma'am. We're actually going to give you some time after the show to talk, so it's come up, so. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I came to hear from you and then also hear um, some of your advice and maybe your story as to what drew you to your success and how to build your Awesome. Okay. I'm ready. That's fine. <laughs> so I, like, I like to feed off of people from energy. Guys. Anybody else energy people? Right? You got to feed off energy, right? So I, I don't take it lightly that you all could be anywhere with anybody doing anything. You took time from your families and from your life and maybe after a hard day at work to be here, so I'm going to be as helpful uh, as possible. You actually pay money to see you too. Yeah, so that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that guy should be singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, uh, so I, believe it or not, I was, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my parents, my father is from Ghana, and my mother is half Ghanaian and half British. Uh, most times when you meet Ghanaian folks, they always start talking about their families and where they're from. Uh, my dad's like 80 years old, and like if I don't talk about him, I hear his voice in the back of my head. <laughs> hey, Kwame, <laughs> how could you be in front of all those people and not talk about daddy? <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing with my hands, so get that one. But, it, but it's important because um, when, we, when we get to the Black Angel Tech Fund, right, it's like I come from a family. My father was born in a village with no running water, no electricity. It's, you know, father had a bunch of wives. And uh, <laughs> it's a classic story, walking to school with no shoes, and all that kind of stuff. And for that young boy to make it to this country, ultimately get a scholarship, undergrad, go to medical school, become a world-renowned oncologist and hematologist, and then put a kid through Cal, Stanford, and Columbia, uh, and today is one of the, the top landowners in the country of Ghana. It's like, I come from that, right? So within one generation, you've got, you know, unbelievably humble beginnings, right? And uh, but that, 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 that background and seeing that story and living that story and watching that story really laid the foundation for almost everything that I did down the road. Like just, just from the standpoint that I, I always believed that everything was possible. I always believed. Right? And we can bring in great stuff from being in the Midwest in the 70s and 80s and the craziness I've seen and experienced. But I always believed that anything was possible. Because if you if you see him, my dad was a living embodiment of that. It's like if he could be in a, a village in Africa, in colonial Africa. He was born in 1940. The country was still colonized. If he goes from that to this, I mean, you know, come on, we can we'll, we'll figure it out. Right? So, so with that said, what did you want to you know do when you were young? What did you want to be when you grew up? It's crazy. It's so crazy. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to I used to watch, and the older heads will, will know what I'm talking about. The younger heads, you're not going to know this. But they, they, one of the the icons of media, television news, was this guy named Walter Cronkite. Right? When I was a kid, like four years old, I was like, I want to be like that. <laughs> right? You still can. Yeah, but it's funny because I've done all this, I've done all this like TV stuff, right? But when I was a kid, I was just like, there was something about, I think, you know, because back in the day we didn't have CNN, like we had 24-hour news, 
So there was this one half hour, Monday through Friday, where you got the, you got the, the international and national news. And there was this being, this guy, was like, that is the way that it was. And like, that was Walter Cronkite. The guy was, he was, he was sophisticated, he was intellectual, he was strong, he was smart, he was authoritative, and, and painfully trustworthy. You knew he was saying that it was true, okay? and it was a comfort because as a kid, right? It's like craziness. You watch, I remember it's wars and stuff on TV, but he was always calm and cool, and he kind of helped you navigate through the craziness. So for me, I, I, I saw that, and I was only that. And so it's interesting because a lot of the stuff I've done in my life, and there's big sections of it, the media, and, you know, the television stuff, and what have you. I was always drawn to that as a child. So I, I like movies. I want to go into production. I remember watching The Wiz. You guys remember The Wiz? Yep. Uh, and was, right? <laughs> and so, like, I used to do that because I was a kid, right? And The Wiz was a remake. For those of you who don't know, it was like a remake with like Diana Ross and Michael Jackson of The Wizard of Oz. And it was incredible. The music was incredible. Quincy Jones was the, the, the composer. But I remember as a kid that the, the production quality of The Wiz was like, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I remember. Being able to put it together, I was like, The Wizard of Oz was made like in the 30s or 40s, something crazy. And this was like in 78. How is it that that looks so good and the production quality is that high? But when it comes to this aesthetic, that is not really that good. And this is my son, the over here. And now, when I was his age, I was like, one day I'm going to make things that are exceptional quality, okay? Because this, I always believe in high standards, right? It wasn't high standards like being hot and taught, it was just high standards because I think it's easy to be lazy, right? It's easy to settle, and I don't like to settle. I like to, to, to try to be the best, be with the best, aspire to the best, and, and ideally make the best, right? So, so you know, when, I, when I'm looking at your, your history, it seems like your journey started out in college after you graduated from Stanford, and that's where you, your journey to like, being this media mogul. Can you talk about that? Oh, uh, media mogul. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, it, 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 I'll give you a little personal thing. Um, it, really, it really started in high school, right? So there's a track that I was on, I was in freshman high school. I was really good at languages. So I wanted to go to international business. Uh, I wanted to do like, you know, law, international business. And my vision was like, I want to travel around the world, put deals together, make stuff happen. When I was a sophomore in high school, my parents got divorced. And I ended up having a pretty serious depression, like, like suicidal craziness. Uh, but, but the reason I say that is a personal, you don't know me, I'm giving you this personal stuff. But it's important because a lot of times people will talk about what they do, and, and, it's, and it's just about pedigrees and degrees and good choices. And all well, everybody's a human being, everybody's dealing with all kinds of craziness. That was the craziness that I was dealing with. And so as a sophomore in high school, I, I said, I, I was, again, I was sort of movies and music and everything else. I was like, we should be using media to impact and make the world better. So I'm going to do that. So I just made a decision when I was 16. I was like, I'm going to do music, I'm going to do film, I'm going to create media, and I'm going to change the world. Right? Uh, and so that was really the path that I, I was on. Uh, it started in high school. So when I was in college, I graduated from Stanford. My degree was in African and African American studies, but I had a concentration on in media, right? And my senior honors thesis was a film, and it was the first time I, in the history of the school where they had an honors thesis for our undergrad that a hundred students all worked on the production. So it's really cool, right? And we were dealing with the same issues we're dealing with now. Literally, we're dealing with in the city right now. It, we were dealing with the Rodney King and you know intersections of race and class and all these different things, and. Um, you know, so I, just, I really had a passion for that coming out of school. And then the crazy thing is, and I'll end here because I'm going to go there, but um, I was, my senior year I was speaking, and there was a woman in the audience, and she came up to me afterwards and she goes, I really like how you speak. You got a really cool message. I got a speakers bureau. I can get you gigs. You should sign with me. So I was like, yeah, but whatever, man, you know. I talked to her, she was cool. <laughs> I didn't have to pay any money. <laughs> <laughs> and like the first gig I got, I know, it is what it is, but like the first gig I got, I was 22 out of school. And it was like $3,200 to 
to go speak for like half an hour to a bunch of high school kids that went to some you know elite private high school in New England. <laughs> Flew me out, hotel, food, thirty two hundred dollars. I was like, yo! <laughs> so it was crazy. So I literally started this bizarre thing where I was like getting booked to speak at these high schools and uh, out of school. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how the, the transition. And then I think from that you went to you know, there were some other media projects that you uh, that it morphed into. I think it was uh, Urban Campfire. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was doing the speaking and that was going really well. You know, remember this is this is pre-internet, right? And uh, I was doing some some side film projects. And part of the thing it was it was crazy. There was a, the message at the time was uh, this late nineties. And the theme was called Architects for the New Millennium. Before we got the internet, right? Before Y2K. And I was like, look, the young people, are you all going to be designing the society of the future, or are you going to be led into it by someone else designing it for you? That was the thing. And we were going to the top elite New England boarding schools, and we were going to the inner city. Look, we were in you know, parts of DC that nobody wanted to go to. We were in Lafayette, Louisiana, that no place that nobody wanted to go to. And we were in Anglo, right? 1300 kids. And that was the theme. And what I was finding was it was resonating with kids of different backgrounds, sociocultural, uh, nationality, ethnicity. It was waking something up in them. Because at the time, you know, most of your high school in the late 90s, you're like, I gotta wait till I'm 35, 40 before I'm gonna be able to really make a difference in the world. But it's different now, we see the parkland students, right? But we live in a different age. Back then, you just felt like I gotta wait another 20 years before I can do anything. And then here comes this guy. It's like, no, you guys are the architects of the new way. You're the ones that can design the society of the future, right? And so I'm doing that, and I'm getting um, a lot of publicity, and I'm having a good time, and it's great. And I was in Durham, North Carolina, April of 1999, when Columbine happened. And we had had this incredible presentation for these young people. We, they were talking about really difficult subjects, right? Bible Bell, homosexuality, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, at the end of it, you had a young guy, a kind of Bible-bumping young kid who was adamant about his beliefs, and another young lady, she's strong about hers. It could have really, you know, boiled up and gotten crazy. By the end of it, these kids were hugging each other and crying. And the teachers, the students, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. It was incredible. So I'm feeling good, we're, we're, we're cultivating a conversation, we're bringing people together, we're dealing with tough issues. I feel like we've got a formula that works in the South, that works in New England, we're gonna really blow this thing out. And I, 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 went, I was in the hotel room, and I saw the Columbine shooting. The two kids that were you know, pushed to the brink, whether it was bullying, whether it was mentally ill, whatever it was, if they had long coats on, shotguns, and went to high school, they started killing everybody they could. And I remember literally like being in fetal position in the hotel room grind. Because I felt I felt this in my soul. I was like, if we could have done in that high school what just happened today, that would have happened. That would not have happened. There's no way that would happen. And so I got really frustrated and I, I made a decision that when I look back on it, I'm not sure I do it now. Uh, but I made the decision I was gonna stop doing the speaking. And I was going to figure out a way to make something that could reach more people. And I knew I had to go in the lab. I knew I had to figure it out. I knew I had to think about it. Um, so it was, a, it was a gamble. And then from that is where we really came up with this formula called Urban Campfire, this traveling talk show for young people. And it was like, you know, again, for the older heads, remember like Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect? Right? It was kind of like that and Oprah for teenagers. Right? So we had like, you know, uh, hip hop stars, we had like Public Enemy and Flavor Play, and we had like uh, Congress people, um, sports stars, and we would bring these folks together to talk with young people about these issues and give them a forum so that they could engage you know, in, in a significant way. So that, that's, uh, that's what I came So, you know, that's a huge endeavor. How did you get the funding for something like that? Yeah, so. I know, you know, most of you as entrepreneurs, not only are you doing the do, but you're studying, right? And you, and you, you probably heard this a lot where people say, 
you know, if you're doing a startup business, you really want to focus on being a business, not being a magnet for funding. Right? Right? You just want to be a business. You want to be cash flow positive. You want to make a product, people buy it, and you get a margin <laughs> from what you're selling it to how much uh, it costs you to make to make a profit. You just gotta you gotta work on it. So remember, this is coming. Everything I'm sharing with you, this is all free internet. This is all before dot com. That's all before people, you know, drop a half a million dollars on napkins because somebody's got an idea. So, it, for me, it was just the hustle, right? It was just the hustle. Um, at the end of the day, businesses are successful because you have a product that people need. You have a product that people want. You have a product that people think they need. Right? And price is only an issue in the absence of value. So for me, you know, I looked at it, on everything that I did, I, I got brought into that world of speaking. I didn't know what the market was. But I learned really quick, hey, people will pay me to, to talk. But it's not like I'm just up there like making stuff up. I got ideas. I care about people. I'm motivating high school students. Like, this is like Tony Robbins for young people, right? <laughs> Nobody was really doing that, right? Um, but it wasn't just motivation. I was turning the thing that was like empowering them. You are the ones who can be the architects for the building. You are the ones that can create the society that you want to see. What are you concerned about? Racism, sexism, all these different issues. You are the ones that can change this. Right? And nobody really talked to them like that. So once it was happening, it was this demand, right? The, the, the students liked it, the teachers liked it, the, the, the decision makers liked it, and they tell other people, hey man, you gotta have this guy come talk. And then it just started going. So with Herbie Campfire, it's like, this is what I mean. You know, I, I came up in a day where you had like, early Oprah, right? Not Oprah, like super global media icon, but like early, the old, the old talk show Oprah, like the old one. And I came up with that and Phil Donahue. Right? So Phil Donahue, they, they would be the pioneers of talk shows. So as a kid, I grew up and I was like, there's this guy, this like manic guy that was like, he'd be in the audience and he had a microphone, talking to people, and they were dealing with really dicey issues or whatever. Like, that's what I saw. So I'm coming up and I'm like, why is the only thing that's focused on young people MTV? Everybody come of age. They want to talk about relationships, they want to talk about the world, they want to talk about race, they want to talk about sex, they want to talk about drugs, they want to talk about stuff that they're struggling with. The adults are having real conversations. Young people just get on TV. Right? So as a business person, right, you're meeting a need. I knew young people want to talk about stuff. When I was 16, I was, I was so suicidal. So I didn't play and talk about what I was going through. Right? So that's why I started with that before. So everything is about the need. I didn't pencil out to, 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 to quantify the need. I didn't go, well, this is what the value of the need is. People will pay me this much if I meet that need. It, it wasn't that. It's, it's, it's simple. You create something, you put it out, people like it. They gravitate towards it. They want it. They want to tell other people about it. Okay? And so with Urban Campfire, what I saw was that once we created something that galvanized people, the word got out. And when we were, I'll tell you one of the deal that we got that was crazy. So, we had an opportunity through one of our advisors to present to McDonald's corporate, okay, not local owner operators like Oak Brook, Illinois. They wanted to sponsor summer events for young adults. So, we got in this competition, we got in the final three. And then we're presenting to like 12 execs at McDonald's. <coughs> now, I've never done at that point an urban campfire with a corporate sponsor. I had done it in schools. So I created a video using all the footage of the stuff that we did at the schools, put this really cool music together, and then did a pitch with their logo on it. This is what urban campfire brought to you by McDonald's would look like. And I literally went in and said hi to everybody and press play on the video. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, they asked me like two questions. Kwame, thanks so much. We'll get back to you. That's it. And I literally went back in the hall. The other two folks came in. They left. They asked the other two to leave. Brought me back in. Said, we're going over here. Okay. So for me, and I don't say that to, to brag and saying that I learned pretty early on. 
if you create something of value, people will pay for it, people will help you to grow it, right? And then the market will expand for you. Uh, and then I just kind of kept watching. Now, along the way, you make mistakes. And some of them are very costly. Some of them are very painful. And then from that, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the balance between seeing what works, doing more of that, experiencing what doesn't work, and either fixing that, iterating that, or not doing that anymore. So, um, with that, uh, you know, I'm actually going through your background. You were talking about it. Yeah. How, how do you manage me on TV budget? Yeah, I was on TV quite a bit until he came along. <laughs> I said, hey, I want to be a stay at home dad for three years. That's, that's what I was doing. Um, I, I think, honestly, I'm sorry, I was talking to Mark. Where's Mark? I was talking to Mark about this. Because, because I had the, uh, the skill and the passion for video production, I was always really good at making these promo videos. And now, again, for the other people, it's like, oh, you can make a video on your phone, you can be on YouTube, you have 180,000 followers, big deal. But just for the younger people, I want you to think about, imagine the day when there was no YouTube. Imagine the day when there was no internet. Imagine how you would have to produce a video and then get somebody in New York to see it. You can send them an email with a link. You can send them a snail mail with a link. Right? So I was always good at making these, these videos. And then I think because of that, um, and the speaking, like I just, I would get invited to places. The little thing, I was on BET, and I took that little video clip of me on BET, and then I pieced it together with some other stuff, and then that got opportunities. And then I was on BET with Chuck D and some other people on some big night news show, and then I took a clip of that and I pieced together with this music. So I kept making these videos of me doing this stuff, and then it was like people saw it. And I'm like, oh, you got on television, can you come speak, can you do this, whatever? And I just kind of keep doing that until it just kind of became what it is. So you have, you know, you've actually had several startups before that. Is there anything you want to talk about the, the you know what you did or maybe things you learned from that startup journey? Yeah, so I, I'll give you a quick one. So the, the, the production company I'm sharing with you was a was an up was you know a business that was uh, operating and thriving just as a regular production company. I'm doing the speaking, we're doing productions, we're traveling around the world, we're working with people like Herbie Hancock and you know, Public Enemy and anybody know the rock band Living Color? <laughs> My favorite rock band of all time. Uh, they're still very, very close friends of mine. I directed a DVD for them in Argentina and in Brazil. And the no, arts are Argentina. Uh, it's Buenos Aires. Or we were in Chile and Argentina. And then we shot a bunch of stuff in Europe as well. Um, when the dot com thing happened, I didn't kind of know what www dot whatever it was going to be. But I was in San Francisco at the time. And I was watching people getting half a million dollars, a million dollars, over cocktails. It was just insane. The people who were not there, it's absolutely true. For the young people, when I wasn't born yet, <laughs> it's absolutely true. It was crazy. I was there. I watched it. And so we literally had people coming up to us like, so you, uh, so you guys doing a dot com? And I'm like, nah, not really. What do you do? I got a production company. Well, that's cool. I mean, can we invest in that? <laughs> 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 I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it was insane. It was insane. We literally raised like a quarter of a million dollars in like a week and a half. I think it was just insane. It was just insane. But it was terrible. I was, tw I was 27. We had no idea how to manage that. We had no idea how to grow it. We had no idea about anything. Uh, and so that was that was one of the painful experiences because we burned through that. And, I, and, and I'll be clear, I don't think we burned through it like we were like, you know, going out to fancy dinners. We started hiring a bunch of people. We started getting all this equipment. See what I mean? Um, we had done really well without that. So had we understood how to use just a little bit of that to create more of a product and more demand, like I talked about, we, we basically could have used that as reserve fuel, but instead we used that infusion of cash for, for quick growth, right? which didn't work out well. <laughs> um, so that ended your production company then? 
Yeah, honestly. It's good. So if you didn't if you didn't take the money, that production company would have stopped probably still be around. Right? It'd been around longer. It, it would have been around longer. I, I share some things with you, you know, if I know then what I you know know now, if I'd done some of those things, it, it not only would have been around longer, we probably could have sold it. Probably could have sold it. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so there one thing that, that you you didn't tell me, you said you're gonna wait tell me about how you, you made your working with prints develop a uh, yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you. So, what's the day? Ten. Okay. So, so we're eleven days away from two-year anniversary of, of Prince passing away. So it's it's tough for me. It's not like we were super close, but I did spend some amazing time with him. Just he and I. Uh, and he poured into me, he shared a lot of cool stuff with me. So it's always a tough time for me, like this time of the year now, um, because I feel like I lost my friend, I lost somebody who gave so much to the world. Um, and plus we had talked about doing so many cool things together. Uh, and even personal stuff, like he was telling me good way to meet him. Uh, and that never happened, you know. So it's still tough. Um, but that said, how I met Prince was, um, to uh, Van Jones. You guys know Van from CNN? So Van and I go back like 20 years, 20, 25 years. We were actually roommates in San Francisco. And um, part of when I had a production company, Van had a bunch of nonprofits and, and kind of youth activist stuff. And we would film all his promo stuff. And then he'd use those videos. So my gift was making the videos. He'd go to New York and be in front of these foundation people, and they'd watch the tapes, and they'd start crying, and they'd just write checks. <laughs> <laughs> and you see Van today, the same thing. This girl that way cries, and he'd write a check. Uh, so, so we, I had done that with him, and we had, you know, obviously kind of came up together. And um, so he and Prince became really good friends. And they had got a benefit concert for one of Van's nonprofits. In Chicago. And so, this is, this is crazy. I gotta tell you, this is crazy. So, they make a decision that they want to do a video. I hadn't been doing that stuff for like 10 years. And Prince said to Van, okay, I, we've done these incredible benefit concerts. What I want to do is produce a small video to show the world what activism, music, and community all looks like. So, I need somebody who understands the work you're doing and understands my music. Because Prince, I get anybody to do videos on like Prince, right? But I need somebody who has that fusion. And, and Van literally said, there's one guy on the planet that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so they call me. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. They call me. Yeah. Of course, all I can see is the phone ringing and Van's mug on my phone. <laughs> and I'm, he was little, he was like four. So I was putting him to sleep, I was getting ready to go to sleep. And I didn't answer the phone. So he's asleep, and I call Van. I'm like, hey man, what's going on? Yo, when I call you, you gotta answer the phone! <laughs> he's like, calm down! You are not that important! He's like, I just called you with Prince on the phone. I almost died. <laughs> Who misses a call for Prince? <laughs> Because of you. <laughs> so he explained what we want to do. He said, Look, you need to text this guy, your address, and he'll send you some stuff and, and, and make it happen. I was like, Cool. So the next day, I got a FedEx package from Paisley Park. <laughs> so me and little guy I have to get on my bed and open the box, and it's a hard drive. We plug the hard drive in, and it has seven different camera angles from his Chicago concert. All the music and a bunch of cool video that stills, still pictures. And I was like, basically, put something together that three to five minutes that just highlights the power of this event. Okay. So I just pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I, I, I haven't been doing it for like 10 years. So I started putting together, Prince, my favorite, favorite artist of all time. And I put something together and I get it done and I send it to the band. And the band and Prince are in, on vacation. In Turks and Caicos. <laughs> <laughs> Rough life. Man, man told him we got there. He, he, he pulls up, and Prince is like, um, just choose whichever house you want. There was like 10 houses. 
Well, who's making this album? It's an album. Have you written an album? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Mary J came and it was just like, pick with your house. So he, there's this moment where a man told me he's sitting with Prince in, in, in the villa and they have the laptop out and he plays the video. And Prince's response, as I've been told, is, I gotta be thinking. What an impression you said to me, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Fortunately, you said, I got to be there. Uh, and so, um, I get an email from his assistant on December 31st, New Year's Eve. And it was like two lines. Prince wants to meet you. I'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Jan 1. Jan 2, <laughs> January 7th, I'm calling Van, like, yo, he said, look, man, this is what we call the purple train. <laughs> you don't know when it's coming, when it's leaving, what's in it, what's not in it, if it's got room for you, if it's got weight. And it, literally, literally, it was like, I, everything with him was extraordinary, but it was like, it was, it was out of a movie. It was like the 12th of January, and I get a text message from his assistant. Your flight leaves tomorrow at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> like, airline confirmation on right? So I show up at the, the airport. This is the next day. You gotta go. So I get to the airport, ready to rock and roll, excited, checking my bags, trying to figure out if this, that. So it, is the first one free and the second one's 25? <laughs> but, uh, Mr. Uncle, you're flying first class. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, that's my first class. All right, cool. <laughs> Now, I'm like, um, so I wasn't clear what the return flight is. <laughs> Mr. Arnold, there's no return flight. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm being kidnapped by Prince. <laughs> this is like straight out of Chappelle show, right? Like, what is going on? It's so, but you know, it's, it's Prince. So you know, yeah. Okay, this is what I know. I, I'm going, first class. I might never come back. <laughs> If he was around, I'd be okay with him. Why would you leave? <laughs> <laughs> you I came back. I came back. So I get there, and like I get off the plane, and it's the whole surreality just begins. First phone call, Mr. Uncle, I have a package claim. I'll see you when you get down. I'm cool. Get there, there's this guy, gets my bags. I'm assuming there's a driver. No, that's the guy who gets the bags and takes you to the limo. That's how his job is. <laughs> you get into the limo. Okay, cool. Going to the hotel. 15 minutes into the drive. Assistant calls. Uh, Kwame Prince wants to see you right now. You're not going to the hotel. You're coming straight to pay for you. Oh my God. I can't go back to the hotel. I got to meet Prince. Oh my God. What am I going to do? All right? Go straight there. Say that. I know. What am I going to wear? You wear what you got on. <laughs> so I get there. And I'm at Paisley. And it's amazing. And there's... The guy who sent me the hard drive meets me there, and um, uh, I'm just waiting, and I'm, I'm like, nervous, and I'm excited, and then his assistant, the one that texts me, we leave tomorrow at 6 a.m., she comes down the stairs, introduces herself, Prince will see you now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Walking up this spiral staircase, following her up, walk down the hall, open the door, now look, as God is my witness, I'm telling you, that's the Chappelle show. When the door opened his office, it was literally like this, this glow behind him. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was a glow. He's walking, he's walking. I can see his silhouette. He's like literally coming over. Like, oh my God, oh my God, what's wrong? He's walking towards me. He literally comes up, and then I can see him right in front of me. And just goes, brother, give me your hands. Welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Turns around, I'm following him, door closes, I look behind, she's gone. <laughs> I'm in Prince's office with him. Just a doors. It was insane. And I literally sit down and he starts talking and I realize like after five minutes I'm not breathing. <laughs> and I compose and like he's not asking me anything, he's talking about music, life, spirituality, frustrations about the industry and all this kind of stuff. It's incredible. And so at some point I realized, like, I don't even know why I'm there. <laughs> 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 I need to audition, this is interview, like, what's going on? Like, so I, you know, I, I, I just 
extra impressive, extra impressive, right? So I'm sitting by myself. So I go, um, yeah, of course you don't know what to call it. You can call it Mr. Prince. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, for a while. Um, yeah, you, know, so like, you don't want to be disrespectful and just say something. You don't know what to call it. So I'm like, um, well, you know, and I wanted to inject about my Stanford and this and kind of whatever. And I literally start talking and he just goes, I know who you are. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and like, when you deal with him, you're dealing with what, what I call the, the literal and the metaphysical. Right? Literal, obviously, literal. But the metaphysical is when he said, I know who you are. Right? I was like, that wasn't like being vetted by the FBI. That's like the spiritual me. Like, yo, man, if you're in my house with just me in my office, you don't think I know who you are? I don't know anything about That's why I'm here. Now, the cool thing about Prince is people say he's very private. He was, unless he let you in. If he let you in, you were completely, literally. So what happened with the app, and sorry, I got this on the app. He shared with me his frustrations. I want to talk to my fans directly. You know, this whole thing, I want to do the music industry. And I just off the cuff said, you need an app. And he goes, can you make that app? <laughs> it was over the life of me. I don't know why I said it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> that's not the crazy part. That's not the crazy part. The crazy part is then he goes, what do you need? And I go, 15 minutes. <laughs> like, I have no idea why I said that. He goes, you've got 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm literally sitting in his office and I'm like, okay, make, make sure I'm understanding what's going on here. I just told Prince he needs an app and I can take care of that in 15 minutes. He gave me 15 minutes and I'm sitting in his office by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Quick show of hands. How many of you think I figured it out in 15 minutes? <laughs> Don't look at the sun. <laughs> So I called my brother, who lives in Ghana, and I, he knew I was going to Paisley. Called my brother, told him what was going on. He's like, cool, I got you, I'll call you back. <laughs> you know and my brother made literally one phone call to a family friend who, so there's, a, there's an international dev company, right, 2,200 employees. <clears throat> Our family friend headed up the entire Africa operations. Everybody in the continent of Africa reported to her, and most of the remote dev teams for the, the high-end clients in India, they all reported to her. So he called her, told her what was going on. She called the CEO of the company in Chicago. She told him what was going on, and his response was, whatever he wants, however he wants it, put the teams on standby, no contract, because he doesn't send contracts, no money up front, and we'll do a rev share on the back get the team set up on standby until he's ready to leave. So he told her that, she told my brother, brother called me, he said, he explained what was going on, he's like, we're good. That literally all happened in less than 10 minutes. And five minutes to start? Five minutes to start. <laughs> you know what I did with those five minutes? I listened to the doves cooing outside. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, he, has done, he still does, he does in his house. They're just cooing in the house. <laughs> So he came back and he just goes, uh, where'd you find out? And I said, okay. There's the craziest thing. He goes, let me show you where you, where you will be working. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave, me a, he gave me a tour of his whole house. And it was literally like meeting rooms, sound stage, studio. And one of the things I'll never forget, this is what I meant about that he was private, but if he let you in, he let you in. He said, you can bring anybody you want to work with you and bring them in. I literally just met him an hour ago. Because it was insane. It was insane. So that, that's literally how the whole thing started. And then, you know, I got to oversee the whole dev team and uh, the business team. It was in Chicago. But I oversaw the, the, the UI, UX. I came up with the whole architecture for the app, uh, the Prince app. Um, uh, worked with the teams in New Delhi, just put all this, the prototyping stuff together. I ran with them several times to show him, you know, what we were building. He loved it. And unfortunately, like a lot of the stuff that Prince, you know, those Prince fans, he would get really into something, and then he's like, I don't want to do that. 
So it was crushing, to say the least. But I'll tell you this, we did that, everything was 2D as, a, as, a, as, a, as an app. But in fact, in the tech form, we've invested in a VR company. So one of my dreams is that all of the stuff that we designed originally for the app, we could actually use in the VR context. Uh, because the whole app was designed that you would literally be in his house. Mm -hmm. And you'd be in the sound stage, you'd be in the studio, you'd be behind the mixing board, you'd be in the, the lounge to view the videos, all this really cool stuff. So my, my, my prayer and my dream is for us to be able to build everything we designed for that app and put that into a VR experience. And obviously work with his family and work with Paisley to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. That was really good, actually. Thanks, man. Um, so going back to the entrepreneurial world, uh, Let's talk about Black Tech uh, Angel Fund. What, what was the genesis? How did it come about? So I'll, I'll give you shorter answers. Give me more questions. Um, so we were we were at a summit in uh, Atlanta. It was, it was a Stanford Black alumni, and um, we were on a panel and we were talking about diversity in tech, right? So there's this whole thing around it, it's what I call it the Silicon Valley diversity syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. So you basically have, with the tech companies, right, less than 2% African Americans working at Facebook and Google and everything else. But that came out maybe four or five years ago, hasn't really changed in four or five years, right? Doesn't mean effort's not being made, doesn't mean money's not being poured into it, doesn't mean high level conversations and things are happening, but fundamentally it's not really shifting. So remember what I shared with you about my dad's story, right? And those of you who know Prince's career, was adamant about ownership, right? He always used to say, if you don't own your masters, your master's on you, right? So I come from that mentality. So when I looked at that, well, there's only 2% uh, you know, African Americans at Google, and we need to change that. We need to force Google to hire more people, who are more diverse people. That's not a business principle. This is not, right? Remember what we said? Price only issued apps and value. Right? Business is based on value. You bring me value, I'll pay for it. So what I said is, look, Google, this is Stanford Black Alumni Summer, right? The founders of Google went to our school. The founders of Yahoo were two years ahead of me in school. The founders of LinkedIn went to our school, YouTube went to our school, PayPal went to our school, Palantir went to our school. Why are we trying to get the guys we went to school with who created companies with hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap? Why are we trying to force them to hire more diverse workforce? If two people created Google, which ultimately employs 100,000 people, well, two people who are African American, two African American women, two Hispanic folks, two anybody, in theory, could create any tech behemoth. And so my thing was like, look, if we're successful African Americans on Stanford, and we're all here, we got capital, we got networks, we got access, we got friends in high places, and we got friends of all different backgrounds and shades who think there's an opportunity. So literally, we came up with this idea. Instead of kind of harping around the lack, why don't we aggregate dollars and invest to create the abundance? Right? That's really where the idea came from. And so we literally, six of us got together, successful in different arenas, but nobody had fun management experience. We just said, we'll figure it out. So we literally just embarked on this crazy journey uh, to create a black angel tech fund to be able to invest in the African American entrepreneurs uh, who were having a hard time not only getting funding, but building not just startup companies, but we wanted folks who were trying to build like Google. And they were crazy enough, remember from uh, uh, President Obama's book, The, uh, the Audacity of Hope, and, and Steve Jobs' whole worldview of life, right? Like, we just, if you, if you used to, People who are crazy enough to think they can change the world, those are the ones that do. Right? So we just knew that it was an issue of not just money, but it was an issue of capital, access to capital, access to networks, and access to mentorship. And we felt, it's a theory, it's a thesis, but we felt that if we could provide those, then we could create success. And then we wanted to change, like Silicon Valley will go, VCs will go, oh, we're going to invest in 10 companies, uh, seven of them will fail, uh, two of them will do okay, and one, hopefully, God willing, will be the unicorn, and it'll make us all the money. Okay? And then you have a lot of VCs, some of them are in here right now, and they'll argue to the moon in the face, and that's just how it is, and it makes sense, and they've made money with that model. I don't argue with that. However, 
why in the world would we be trying to find 10 African American entrepreneurs, waiting for seven of them to show signs that they're not going to work, and then just completely wipe them off the thing because we're not going to make any money with those things? That doesn't make sense. I believe you should be setting people up for success. So what we should do is make the, the process pretty hard to get into class, if you will. And then what we should do is we should be access capital mentorship networks. And then we should be leveraging all of the partnerships that we have to help make as many of them successful. Not wait to see which ones are showing signs of ailment and which one looks like it could be the unicorn. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but when you don't come from VC, you're not, you're not, you're not restrained by the confines of, of, of certain thought patterns. Right? It's like, well, I, there's a saying I love that Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you see things, the things that you see change. Right? So when you don't come in with all these preconceived notions of how stuff's supposed to be, you can be a lot more creative, right? So we said, this is what we're going to do. How do we, we raise the fund? We could have just gone to you know, our gazillionaire friends in Silicon Valley and raised it quickly. What did we do? We took a road trip. We went out to places that never get to see these things. We went to Minneapolis. We went to, to, to Atlanta. We went to D.C. We went to New York. We went to places and literally were people's living rooms explaining what we're trying to do. And it wasn't just to raise the money, but we wanted to build a network of people who had a vested interest in the success of the fund. So then as we started to invest, we could leverage those relationships to get those companies deals, to get them introductions, to help them grow. See what I mean? That's not a typical VC model, right? But again, remember we talked about that creative, that creative lens, right? When you come to something with a creative lens that you all do as entrepreneurs, you're iterating, you're coming up with new ways to do stuff. So we just did the same thing. So what are you looking for in an investment company? So, or a company that you would want to invest in? So I, I'll give you the boring stuff and then I'll give you the cool stuff. Right? The boring <laughs> stuff is like, <laughs> company has to show revenue, uh, has to have a defensible revenue model, uh, has to have an impressive team built, uh, has to have strategic growth partners in place already, we prefer to have an accelerator, incubator, process, da 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 da. Right? That's what you're looking for. That's the boring stuff. The stuff that I look for is the stuff that a talent agent looks for. It's called the it factor. That's what I look for. Just get real quiet. <laughs> See, they won't raise that. Some of, them, some of them are wondering if they have it. The, the it factor is imagine, you know, back in the day when you had the AR people who would find that this, they're signing artists, right? So imagine you're looking for an R&B singer. I think we can agree. There's probably 10,000 amazing R&B singers in the United States. Right? So how would you choose the one to sign? You can't really say that he or she is better than somebody else because they're all incredible singers. Right? But there's an it factor. There's a special quality about certain people that's above and beyond just the talent alone and the idea. And when you hear the stories of the folks that, that our attorney for our fund is the attorney that was joined at the hip with Steve Jobs at the beginning of Apple for 10 years. That's our attorney for the fund. So I've heard the stories of the day Steve Jobs walked into law firm and decided to work with right? I've heard it. And what you see is this pattern. Whatever their quirks were in terms of their personality, there was this it factor. There was something unique about them. They saw the world differently. That, that, that craziness about thinking that anything is possible. There's a balance between knowing how to connect with people, having a balance of humility and, and confidence, right? Because th this is what I believe, you guys. We, we, we really do ourselves a disservice when we just focus on the money. Right? We really do at every level. And the reason why is because, look, the idea is incredible. The market penetration opportunities are extraordinary. The ROI can be ridiculous. How are you with your team? How are you with your dev team? How are you with people? Because at the end of the day, here's half a million dollars. Yeah, you got funded. You got staff meeting. You got to work through problems. You got to close deals with partners. People get to do business with people that they know, that they like, and they trust. Are you that guy? Are you that gal? 
Do you have that ability to connect with people, motivate people, inspire people? Listen, when your team is pushing on you as a CEO, they're pushing back on you. Do you get angry? Do you get defensive? Do you fire people just because they're questioning you? See, can you listen? Can you contemplate? Can you choose, can you choose people? There's all these things that you got to be able to do, especially a young entrepreneur, man, you're 24. How do you know how to do all that stuff really well? And as we all know, people 44 and 54, they can't do it at all. <laughs> right? So what I look for is that quality. That there's this uncanny it factor around the person. That they've got the ability to connect with people, to show empathy, to lead, to listen, to know when to really strike, and know when to just sit back. Right? Like that's an incredible, incredible quality. And I don't want those of you who are kind of in this space going, I don't know if I can do all that. I don't know if I'm really that person. That's the great thing about being an entrepreneur. You don't have to be. But you have to find that person. You gotta find that person. Or in time, through your journey, you'll become that person. Okay? Does that make sense? Um so actually, you know, when I first met you at there, we had a summer party. In fact, we're going to have another summer party in July. And uh, I remember, the, I, I was just, you actually, rare events, right? You had a group of people that you were talking to. And you're like, you know, I, I work with a lot of, you know, I'm all over the world working with startups. And like, I didn't even realize that we had a tech scene in our own backyard. So now with that said, what do you think of this happening on tech scene? Yeah, so I, 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 I got to correct my friend a little bit. I don't want y'all to think I'm like out of my mind. Like, you know, the tech scene. It wasn't that much. What I said was, in my, I've been doing it fun. We came up with the idea three years ago, just as an idea. We had to design everything, and we started raising for the fun just last year. So most of my work in different iterations has been outside of Sacramento, and then. But I live here, and I've lived here since 05. Now I'm doing what I'm doing with the farm. I was getting invited to all these places, Birmingham, Alabama, and Durham, North Carolina, and invited to speak at these places. And our entrepreneurs that we were funding, one was in Miami, one was in DC, one was in New York. And so we didn't have any companies here. And yet nobody was saying, hey, Kwame, you come do anything here. So it literally, like, I just wasn't plugged into the scene. So I, I knew the scene was here, but I just wasn't plugged into it. And what happened was like seven months ago, there's literally two people, uh, well, we'll say three, but, uh, <laughs> my friend Lindsay and uh, my buddy Clayton over at Valley Extends and my friend Mariah Lichtenstern. It was like literally those three people were the folks that yeah, got me like, completely plugged in and then everything like, Crazy. Like all of a sudden, I'm like I'm doing stuff with the Kings, and I'm on the cover of Sacramento Business Journal twice in six months, and you know what I mean? Like you know, it was just all this craziness happened. Because Lindsay was like, "Yo, she connected me to folks at Sac State. I did this event. The president of Sac State was like, "Hey, I want you to be on the advisory board of this new six million dollar innovation center." Right? Cool. Right? So all these things started happening. Now, th th this is the takeaway for entrepreneurs. I want you to think about. Yep. Aspects of my life and my story are somewhat interesting, but really, you're here for you. Right? So when people ask me around success, relationships, networking, a very simple philosophy. Okay? The wider and deeper your network is, the easier your life is. Okay? It's really simple, let's break it down. Okay? If you say, networking, if people just meet a bunch of people, that's why. Okay. You show up at enough events, they have enough people, you meet all kinds of people and get connected on LinkedIn. You're going wide. I said the wider and deeper your network is, the easier your, not business, your life is. See, everything else comes after that. Because in life, if your life is, is better, it means everything will be better. Relationships, <coughs> business, money, everything. So you got to go wide and you got to go deep. Deep simply means that it's not just about meeting people, it's spending time, it's developing that relationship, it's getting to know them, it's being of service to them, right? It's showing up, 80% of success is just showing up, 
right? When you do that formula, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, in 45, I probably really understood what I'm telling you 10 years ago. Seriously. That's why I always love being able to talk to younger people in particular, because it's a, you know, in him. I mean, he's seen me speak, and he knows a lot of this stuff. But the reality is, I taught him most of this stuff by the time he was seven. Literally. Literally. By the time he was seven. Right? Because I realized, like, I was a relatively smart guy, I went to Stanford, but I didn't understand these fundamental, fundamental principles of success in life until I was like early 30s and mid 30s. Right? I was like, well, what would happen if you could train these ones? These are simple principles, right? The wider and deeper, the easier your life is. That's easy, right? But if you could train these kids to understand these principles foundationally before they were 10. They, they just get it locked in. And so that would mean that they'd be so much further uh, ahead. And that's, that's, that's really what I've done during terms of my own life. As we learn stuff, I'm, I'm grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for what I've learned. I do wish I'd learned some of it earlier. But I'm grateful I got this guy, right? Because he doesn't just take good pictures. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a pride and joy because we're, we're, we're training a new generation, right? A lot of So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up the questions to the audience, OK? <laughs> <laughs> this will be the most difficult question of the night. Mr. Anku, how can I help you? Um, Mr. Anku, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> that is a great question. 803. Thank you. 803. <laughs> That's a bold kid. He asked the time and then started dancing in the corner. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, you've done a lot of things. Out of all the different things you've done, what are you the most proud of? <laughs> it's not because, yeah. No, I'm serious, man. I'm serious, man. Look, I, 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 I've been very successful, and I've been dismally a failure at a lot of stuff. Right? And some of those things have been within the same thing, right? It was a bigger business, great success, embarrassing failures. Some of it's been in marriage, right? It's... When I look at everything I've done, like literally the only thing, I can look at the whole track record and go up and to the right. I'm proud of every minute, every hour, every year. Honestly, it's being a dad. Seriously. This is the only thing I feel like I've done really well consistently over time. And then I'm just watching the results in a way. And I'm being proud like, <laughs> yeah, that's my son. I did a great job. It's not that. It's the. It's the. It's the. It's the I didn't teach him how to do that. Myself. <laughs> he taught himself. Right? But it's. It's. When I see. When I, when I see the, the values, the way he walks in the world, the respect he has for other people, the light that he brings, the thoughtfulness, the inquisitiveness, the intellectual sophistication, what I'm doing, I want to. We, we can contribute to the world and what we do. Uh, his, his mom and I were married, and we got divorced when he was two. And like a, a lot of guys, you know, they move to another city and see their kid on the summers, send money back. Okay? I was like, I do not want this kid to be 14 have anger, resentment issues, that not only towards me, but they will play themselves out with his friends, with his mom, with his teachers, with his girlfriends, with his future wife, maybe the police, and all kinds of other people. Simply because he feels like I was not there for him. It was a choice. The choice was I'm the opposite. I'm gonna be as present as possible. Right? He's with me all the three weekends a month. Every practice, all the sports, Right? I'm there with them. We have a ritual we do every night, right, before we go to sleep, right? We watch Shark Tank together, we watch the Fox. <laughs> <laughs> right? We have my business deals right? together, right? We do all this stuff. Well, what does that mean? It's like, he's set up for a trajectory. Now I was out. Like, what, what kind of student is he going to be? What kind of friend is he going to be? What kind of boyfriend is he going to be? What kind of husband is he going to be? What kind of contributor to society is he going to be? 
He's going to be a cat that people can rely on and count on, and he can inspire people when they're down, right? Because we're pouring into him now. Doesn't mean he's not going to get hurt, doesn't mean he's not going to make mistakes, doesn't mean he's going to be perfect, but it means he's going to be probably 10, 20, 50 times better than if he didn't have that. So, so out of all the stuff we've done, the fund and investments, we do this incredible stuff in Africa. Uh, we talk about it, we do that in part two, uh, but it's, it's literally being a dad. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about, uh, I'm an educator, and I'm moving into the ed tech world, okay. and I'm interested in your work with youth in the beginning, and how that shows up in your work today. So is it, what would you say that you gained from that time when you were a young man that you still utilize? Yeah. If you don't mind, what was your name? Tiffany. So if you don't mind, Tiffany, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, the attention on young people, the teenagers, right, kind of youth today, is arguably the best investment of our time. Um, but I think that they are the first global generation that has more power than any youth generation ever but it's also the most confused about how the world actually works. <laughs> and it's not their fault. It's, it's not their fault. The distortion of everything, time, accessibility to stuff, information, I, I saw it on YouTube, you know what I mean? Like, the surreality of their life is something I think is hard for most of us to understand. But let's focus on the positive. Right? I say I think they're the most powerful youth generation that the world has ever seen. Because when we were kids, when we would go home, when you closed the door, you were disconnected from the planet. The fact that they can connect, their voices heard, they can produce. You know, back in the day, we used to say, man, we, 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 want, we want to be the programmers, not the programmer, right? The man's making television shows, he's programming your mind, he's brainwashing you, right? <laughs> because there was these big television networks that created the stuff. <laughs> Bombarded your brain, but it wasn't too late. So you tell me now, you can create your own content on your phone and edit it and use it and post it, and nothing <laughs> speaks more to that than what we're seeing with this uh, March for Our Lives. Right? Politics aside, just the fact that they can organize at that level, <clears throat> no new generation could have done that before. So it's not just the technology; it's the sophistication of knowing how to use it. However, this is where I challenge them. This is where I challenge them. Look, let me grab this on here so we say, look, most young people will go, okay, so how many of you have a cell phone? Everybody raise their hand. Like, <laughs> <laughs> For those in the back, yes, he just bowed. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, the question, what am I the most proud of? <laughs> <laughs> you just watched? <laughs> Thank you, sir. We just, just trying to get an extra five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're a young person. You got a cell phone. And you understand this. You are holding a device that has more processing power than the United States government had when we put a man on the moon in 1969. Can the argument be made, proportionally speaking, that you and your generation? are making the kind of changes in the world that should be commensurate with having that kind of power in your back pocket? The answer is no. The answer is no. And see, that's the other half of it. That's what I'm saying. They have got, like, vibranium power. <laughs> and they're sitting around like Snapchat. And Snapchat. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> you guys can be curing cancer with this stuff. <laughs> So it's up, it, because we sold this technology around, oh, it makes your life easier. Like, no, 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 no,
more processing power than the U.S. government had in 1969. The power is in your hand. The question is, how are you going to harness this to create the world that you want to live in? That's police brutality. That's whatever gender inequalities, right? Because whatever isms, whatever things you see that you want the world to be better because you're young and you're idealistic and you want to change the world, how are you doing that with this? See, we got to give them the tools, but then we got to push them 10 times harder to push them. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so what advice would you give to uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, trying to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and kind of like get over the fear of the unknown or somebody on the start of business? What's your name, sir? Uh, Sam. Sam. Okay. Have you seen that, 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 that clip that's going somewhat viral of Will Smith? Where he's talking about the guy who's yelling at him. He's like, oh, Will Smith! Oh, man, I love you, man! One day I want to be an actor just like you! Right, have you seen that clip? So he basically so he has this clip. He says, he said, when I hear people say that, I think to myself, most people are not willing to do what it takes to be who I am and have what I am. When I say happen, I'm starting to cheer. So when you say that the fear of the unknown, how do you overcome that? Um, what I've learned, and, and I don't think this could be like sound like esoteric, I, I mean it literally, <laughs> is the goal is not to overcome the fear, right? The goal is to go after it, right? And that's what I mean by that. Success is not found in your comfort zone. It's not. It never is, right? So when you look at the difference between people who are Successful. It's like anything. Like, like okay, forget business. Because he's successful. Like, hey, I want to ask this person now. She's beautiful. She looks like someone I would like to talk to. If I ask her, she might look at me like, what are you talking for? She might embarrass me in front of her friends. She might embarrass me in front of her girlfriends. Right? She has to come talk to me. <laughs> right? I got to take a risk. So I'm, I'm out. This is the, the comfort zone right here. Hanging out. Woo, this is great. This is comfortable. <laughs> this is what's uncomfortable. Beautiful girl. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's just easy because you know, radiating magnetism. <laughs> 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 and, but there's no point. Like, that's the comfort zone. So the only way that you're going to experience the success is to be outside of it, which is what? It, it engenders anxiety. It engenders fear, right? uncomfortable feelings, self-doubt. But what happens is, is that your comfort zone starts to expand, right? So the more you're out of it and you realize, okay, I can hang here. I'm proud of myself that I stepped out and took the risk. Even when you fail. Even when you fail, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't, when people always say this thing of like, fail forward, you have to get a fail, and fail, and fail, and fail. It doesn't work if you're not understanding why you fail. And we got to be careful with that because I think a lot of people embrace that. Like, yeah, man, I see you screwing up. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep failing, man. You know, I mean, guy on YouTube, man, Gary Vee, he goes, I keep failing, man. <laughs> How we get there? No. <laughs> That's called being a failure. <laughs> no. no. No, 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 no. Don't say it. Outside the comfort zone, you take the risk, you see what happens, and you make a commitment. Now I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep taking the risk. But then I'm going to learn when the stuff doesn't work. <laughs> now here's the other secret though. This is a big thing for entrepreneurs. Ah oh, man. I wish I wish I had this was on there. When you start now, get a group of advisors from the beginning. Okay? From corporate standpoint, it could be a board of directors, an advisory board, or a personal set of advisors. When you venture out. I'm telling you, it's the biggest mistake I made late 20s getting into this space. We didn't create boards because we didn't want people telling us what to do. We didn't create boards because we didn't want them to fire us. We didn't create boards because we didn't want to be accountable. Truth be told, now that I'm 45, it's different. I just get accountability. I want to be accountable. I want people to be accountable to me. When I was young, I was like, I don't be accountable to anybody. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. Advisors. Imagine you're talking about getting out of your comfort zone and overcoming fear. What if before you were making these decisions, 
you could talk to people who in the room had 100 years of experience, who believe in you, who know things you don't know, who have networks and access, they make 10 times more mistakes, see what I mean? And you're, you're, you're getting counsel from them before you make these big decisions. See what I mean? World of difference. So between you saying, hey, embrace the fear, face it, grab it, and keep doing it, and having advisors, you should be ready. Right? You should mitigate a lot of unnecessary mistakes and unnecessary missteps to end up hurting. Okay. Okay. So this is young lady in the back door. Yes. Any question? Yeah. So I'll give you a couple things, and then I'll give you kind of the secret to getting the person you want. Okay? So what, what I, what, to answer your question. So what I'm looking for, number one, is I want somebody who's gone where I'm trying to go. They've gone to where I'm trying to go. I want somebody who's done what I'm trying to do. Sounds similar, but there's a nuance there. Okay? They've gone where I want to go. They've done what I want to do. I want someone who has the time. I want someone who has the time, right? Because look, they can have the pedigree and they can have the background and they can be super impressive, but if they don't have the time to meet with me and help me, right? And not just help me, but be on the phone saying, hey, Kwame, I love what you're talking about. I've got a friend in LA that you need to talk to. Let me put you guys in touch, right? I, so I need that. Don't want to try to go, don't want to try to do, and they've got time, okay? Now, in order for you to help that person, you got to understand what they want out of a mentee. You see what I mean? you got to know, because then it becomes, why am I going to give you my time? And nine times out of ten, the mentor will say about the mentee, they remind me of myself when I was their age. So your job is to know who that version, the young version of them was. You see what I mean? And how do you align with that? Okay? You are a go-getter and you're passionate about a particular thing, and that's what they were passionate about when they were young. And you've read the stories about how they were the president of the club at the university, and how they, they, they created something that had never been done before in the history of the university. And they created all this you know, craziness, uh, but with, at the end they prevailed, right? A lot of people don't know that story, but you researched and you found that story. So you know that. So by the time you're talking to them, you don't necessarily bring it up. But what you're looking for is for them to go, I see a young version of me and you. And most people, quite frankly, not that you're saying mentors necessarily like 40, 50, whatever, but most folks over 40, most folks over 40, they feel that thing that I share, right? I, if I knew them what I know now, my life is so different. Mm -hmm. I can't go back, but I can give back. See, so they're, they're motivated to be able to pour back into folks that are not only just younger in terms of your age, but just in terms of the journey. You see what I mean? So if they're 18 miles ahead of you on the journey, and you got a chance to kind of teleport and hang out with them for a little bit, you see what I mean? They want to have that relationship with folks that are trying today to kind of do what they did when they were younger. Does that make sense? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, where were we? Gary? Gary? Okay. Um, and, then, and, then, and then there's some back. Yes? Uh, just one thought on that. As an Please. entrepreneur, I, I, what has really helped me work is, you know, there's a time when um, a lot of venture capitalists and stuff, you, know, you had to go to the schools and stuff to get a lot of this Now most, most venture capitalists and VC more which are obviously they have so many good block posts. And can, every, there's so much knowledge just out there from their real, real life experience that it's super helpful to read all that stuff. So, yes, sometimes it's hard to find it, right? Silicon Valley and Towers, maybe they're not really good at reading, really, but just reading the block posts and stuff. So, yeah. Really so, one quick question I had was 
And then we talk about scaling up rapidly and you know, big companies for the next Google and stuff like that. How does, how does the company think, you know, this is a you know, so slightly further along question. Yes, now you have revenue, you have uh, you, you have a mark, uh, product market fit, you make, let's say, half a million dollars in revenue. When, how, do, how do I think about a shift in the mindset of shifting away from bootstrapping and now I want to you know, the market for you because, you know, yeah. Raise money, you know, grow fast. Yeah. Should I, should, you know, should I continue to just grow this revenue and reinvest, or should I go aggressively? Yeah. How does that? I know. Okay. Think so, if you don't mind, I want to I want to go back to your first point, as your suggestion, and I start. So we talk about the blog posts, right? So again, that's the thing of the young entrepreneurs, right? This, like this last week, right? I'm, I'm getting ready, and I'm, I'm, I'll be out of at home, I'm shaping, I got my YouTube, and I'm literally watching Mark Andreessen at Stanford uh, and two other VCs, and the topic is how to raise startup capital. Right? So I'm learning from the Silicon Valley Angels guy, and I'm learning from Mark Andreessen himself, from Andreessen no Right? Not because I went to hang out with him, he's literally in my house. <laughs> right? So the ability to get access to the information, the genius, the expertise, the lessons, the how-tos. Right from their mouth. It's right from them. It, it, for half an hour or three hours a day, it's just extraordinary. So I, I really want to, I'm glad you mentioned that, and I think it's very important. Here's, here's the thing. I'm going to apologize, because there's not a, a magic bullet answer to what you're saying, because it's always company and product specific. Okay? Now, a lot of people, and recently I'll tell you this, it's like, you know, bootstrap as long as you can. Right? Like, bootstrap as long as you can. And everybody has a different philosophy. It, it also has to do with what is it that you're looking to do? And what is, the, what is your competition? In some cases, you're further ahead, but they could catch up to you within six months. So you're doing $70,000 a month, and it take four to six months before your competitor catches up to you? You're trying to do this. Rocky fuel. And you can take $60,000, $70,000 a month to an investor, a little bit of a month of month over month growth, right? Don't put money in it, you're gone. That's smart. If you're doing some disruptive stuff nobody else is doing, you, you're, you're getting contracts, you're growing, your team is good, you got cash in the bank, you constantly getting in front of folks to get partnerships and deals, then you, it, it, see, it's all, it's all what you want and it's all product and company specific. <laughs> Some companies, we talk about scaling, they get destroyed because the magic of your company is the fact that you guys are 10 deep. Here's $2 million, and I need you to go to 50 by the end of July. That means you've got 40 people that you don't know. Okay. Now, are you the type of CEO that can manage that? No, because I've never done that before. Or, yeah, this is my fifth startup, I've done this a million times. Oh, the VC. Right? Right? Why? Because he does before. He understands that. So scaling is, is not just something that's a natural part of the process. You gotta scale, you gotta make all this money and all that kind of thing. It's not that. It depends what you're doing. If you're doing uh, a social media app for young people, <laughs> you get some traction, you're gonna want to shoot through the roof because they're fickle, they change their mind, people are gonna steal your stuff. Some of our bigger social media friends will steal your feature, as we say. <laughs> story, 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 right? They just steal it, right? So it really depends. You do enterprise software, and you've got a hold on this, and you're killing it, and you've got these incredible partners all over the world, you don't have any competition, you got money in the bank, you see what I mean? So there's not a magic bullet answer for what you're asking, but to those of you who are wondering maybe similarly, that's where the advisors come in because they're helping you analyze the, the factors I'm talking about, right? And they can help you to make the best decision for you and your company. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Is there something in the back? And then how are we out of time? Uh, I'm going to take two more questions. Okay. <clears throat> yes, sir? Um, yeah, you thank us earlier for us being here. Uh, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. okay. So thank you very much. Uh, going back to where this what you said about the creating an easy, Easy fire for teenagers. If you were starting a business, what would you start as an impactful business that they can pick up in? 
I mean, like, I was going to start a business right now. What, what, what specifically would I do? What industry would I be in? For, 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 for like, for... Are you looking for an idea, John? Are you making like social impact? Yeah. Social impact. Um, I, I'll tell you what I, what I would do, and Tiffany's kind of goes to your point, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a company that I'm really excited about called Rio, and they're doing a social impact and a social media plan, yeah. right? Um, and, and their whole thing is, Remember going back to the story I shared with you, right? So we created an urban campfire. There was no internet. What is that? To gather with young people, to talk about the issues they care about, right? to bring people together, to create solutions, to make the world better, and create the world that they want to live in. Right? That was pre-internet, pre-online connectivity. What Grio is doing is, 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 is doing that in a social media app where the posts are these video bites, but the whole idea is to move past the craziness that you see on, on, on Twitter and the rants and the divisive, angry, kind of attack type of tirade, trolling dynamics, right? Yeah. Is to create what they call a safe space, a brave space, excuse me, for people to express themselves, listen, connect, and ultimately come up with new ideas of things that they want to do, right? So that company came out of Stanford, they pulled back 200 grand, and, and this was like back in the day, they just did this literally like two years ago. Pulled out two hundred thousand dollars over frozen yogurt. Tom talking about the idea. Literally two hundred grand to get them started. They went they were in Y Combinator last year. They came out, Michael Siebel put money into them, Adrian Fenty put money into them, uh, Chris Yeh, who went to school at Stanford, BC Dunham Valley, he put money into them. And they're literally trying to figure this out. If if I if I wasn't doing what I'm doing and they hadn't created that, that's what I would have that's what I would It's social. Uh, it's called Rio, G-R-E-O, Rio. G -R -E -O, Rio. <laughs> yeah. Really, really impressive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because the whole idea is you're using technology to connect people. It's not, nobody knows what the answer is to any of this, this stuff. It's almost nobody knows. But what we know is everybody has the pieces. So if you can connect people in the right, this is what I was saying, right people at the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing, for the right reasons, you get the right results. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we've got this technology that can connect people that we've never seen before. So now you get the right people in the right place, doing the right thing, at the right time, for the right reasons, and then you're going to see the changes start to manifest. Right. You know, so if they can figure that out, or somebody can figure that piece out, or what Tiffany, what you're doing, and what the students are being inspired to get on these platforms, yeah. you know, then you're going to see things that we've never seen before. All right, last question. Uh, so Sorry. we'll talk after. Uh, just if someone, uh, maybe first time entrepreneurs that you've bumped into uh, throughout time, I'm just curious, what are some of the worst decisions that you <laughs> can make? Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. So, my friend in front says, meeting first time entrepreneurs, what's consistently the thing that you've seen where people are making, uh, what was the worst decisions you see people consistently make? <coughs> um, excuse me, number one, not having that board, not having the advisors. Uh, that's, 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 that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is focusing more on raising money than um, building the product. Right? Focusing so much on raising money and not focusing enough on, on building the product. As entrepreneurs, especially when you're raising, right, it's a juggling act. You gotta create the product, you gotta iterate the product, you gotta create the sales presentations, you gotta hit the table, you gotta talk to people, juggling at, juggling at, juggling at, no problem. The problem is when you're focusing so much on raising money, and you're not working on the product. Because the product is, is at the end of the day, when you're pitching to somebody, they're going, who's using this? Show me the beta numbers. How many active users do you have? How much money are they paying? How long are they staying on your app? See, if all you're doing is raising money, you're not focusing on making those numbers better. Then you're not one. You're not raising them, but two, you're not growing your business. Right? So I would say that's that's the second thing. Uh, oh my God, I got to do this. So I wanted to have this done today because I'm going to tell you guys you can go to it. Uh, but I had to do this this interview with Sirius XM today, uh, so I didn't get it out. So hopefully Thursday, and I want everybody before we leave, before we break. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, we're going to do it like in the room with your phone, so we can stay connected. But I'm writing a piece. This is called. Five pillars of the pitch. <laughs> Five pillars of the pitch. Okay. And
and this is consistently, my dear friend, what's your name? Mike. Mike, my dear friend, Mike, <coughs> this, is, this is the most painful thing that I see all time entrepreneurs. You don't have to be five pillars in the pace. You're going to be crazy. Number one, this is the five pillars. You have to have this in presentation. Number one, what is the problem that your company is solving? Number two, how big is that problem? Number three, how do you uniquely solve that problem? Number four, how much money can you make by solving this problem? And number five, don't worry about writing it down. You've got a LinkedIn article, you can read it. And number five, why are you and your team best qualified to solve this problem? Now, I see a lot of people shaking their heads, a lot of people nodding, <coughs> it makes sense. What I just told you is painfully basic. Right? There's nothing groundbreaking there. But I'm telling you, I'm doing a long time. 90 to 95% of the presentations I see don't have that in there. And then you have people complaining about not being able to raise money. <laughs> see what I mean? So it's going to be promise five dollars a pitch. And then beyond LinkedIn, it's free. <laughs> you can read it, use it, quote it. Uh, and I'll tell you, most VCs, they might, you know, they might be, you know, kind of highbrow. Oh, it's more sophisticated than what he's saying. <laughs> you know, don't worry about that. Just ask him this. Just ask him this. Would you agree that these five, at least these five things need to be in the presentation? I'm telling you that most of them will say absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, so, can I say thank you? Sure. Okay. So, what I'm going to do, I, 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 so three things. One, uh, slowly take out your phone. Go on LinkedIn. <laughs> I know half of you already, my friend. Go on LinkedIn. K W A M E A N K U. Let's get connected there. <coughs> I don't have cards. It's going to give you a card, uh, but I have that. <coughs> we'll connect there. Uh, I'm not uh, protective of my stuff, so I give my phone number. It's no problem. Uh, that that stuff is easy. But let's make sure that we're that we're connecting, uh, not just with one another. But like opportunities, if you see stuff that you think will be of interest, right, just let me know, and, and vice versa, okay? So that's that. Um, the second thing is, I don't have a lot of time after, because I leave this one the best. <laughs> so I'm going to stay, because I know there's some people who ask questions, and I want to make sure we get those answered. Um, there's only, I only say a little bit. Okay, that's it. Third thing is thank you, thank you, and thank you. I walk in gratitude, and I'm very appreciative. Uh, I had a crazy life situation of health issue in 2013, uh, which rendered me in the hospital, uh, and I got in there, collapsed at 11, 10 p.m., and the doctor said <coughs> I had less than seven hours to live. And he watched me go down uh, in the ER at four. He was four years old. And uh, to be here today, five years later, healthy, no residual health effects, nothing going on, up to you as I'll get up and have the opportunity to share with you, pour into you, reflect the things that I've learned and I've gone through is such a blessing to me. And I just want to let you know that I'm just grateful to have a chance to connect with you and share with you. So I just want to say that. So thank you. So we actually made a video game for you. <laughs> That's awesome. With appreciation to Kwame Anku for support of the Sacramento Startup Community, and we have Samurai Anku. <laughs>